When I was in the seventh grade, my middle school principal told me that I would be in jail before I got to or could even apply to college. That comment has stuck to me like a bad tattoo ever since I walked out of that room. Now, I stand here today as a college student, and I can tell you that he was probably right. If I didn't reboot and refresh the way I looked and felt about myself and the world around me, I wouldn't be here right now. I was a deviant. Starting fights, cussing out my teachers, and wreaking havoc on my middle school was all in a day's work. In fact, I was so out of control that in the seventh grade, I got myself permanently banned from the place with more flags and more fun. Six flags. <laughs> they, they threw me in a room with rubber bars, took my mugshot, and made me sit there and wait until everybody else at my summer camp was leaving. I now know that insecure people behave poorly. I was the fattest kid in my middle school. I didn't really have any friends. I had horrible grades, and my dad just moved across the country. I didn't believe in myself, and honestly, I felt like nobody else believed in me. Why should they? I was behaving like a degenerate. But this proves my point. I was very insecure and behaving very poorly. The opposite of insecurity is confidence. And I want to be clear, I'm not talking about cockiness, hubris, or ego, no, but genuine self-confidence. Being believed in creates confidence. It can be your own belief in yourself and your abilities, right? Malcolm Gladwell says it takes 10,000 hours to truly become a master at something. So it can be your belief in the time, energy, and effort that you've put into sharpening the tools of your trade or it can be the belief that others have in you. Just knowing that you have somebody who's willing to step up to the plate and go to bat for you inspires confidence. That's great, wonderful even. But as Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Not being believed in, it fuels you, it hardens you, it numbs you to the fears of loss, rejection, and hearing the word no. It forces you to become comfortable being uncomfortable, which is crucial to a fruitful life. So in order to truly progress, you need both. You need the grit and the resilience that comes from not being believed in because it makes you comfortable with the uncomfortable and forces you to become adaptable. You also need the confidence that comes from belief because it gives you the ability to say, that's what I want to do, and the confidence to take action and do it. Confidence and competitiveness often go hand in hand. I'm a very competitive person. I come from a very competitive family. Our family monopoly games will rapidly devolve into multi-day wars of attrition that are fraught with collusion, hostile negotiation tactics, and the occasional crooked banker. <laughs> My mom's side of the family is Greek, very Greek. So Greek that my grandmother jokes that because I was born in Australia, she wanted to name me Yanis Kingarunis Saretis. And I would tell her that, Nana, that would have been child abuse. But it's been on my bucket list to learn Greek for a little while now, and I've been chipping away at it. Currently, my vocabulary consists of two words that I picked up from my grandmother. There's karpuzi, which means watermelon, and skase, which means shut up. <laughs> but the more I learn about the language, the more it fascinates me. For instance, in Greek, there's a bunch of different ways just to say the word love. But what I find most interesting about the language is one single word. This word doesn't have a definition or translation into any other language. In fact, if you rounded up a hundred of the Greekest Greek people that you can find, sat them all down in a room and asked each one of them to define this word, you would get a hundred different definitions. The word that I'm talking about is philotimo. When you break the roots of the word down, you get philos, which means friend, and timi, which means honor. But looking at it from the surface level is about as useful as a screen door on a submarine. Philotimo is the Greek's golden rule. It means working hard, working with integrity, and taking pride in your work. It means being a genuine leader and building others up, being compassionate and empathetic. It means doing the right thing, not because it's the easiest thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do, and because you have Philotimo, you want to do it. A great example of Philotimo is the Battle of Thermopylae. It's the battle that inspired the movie 300. Every single one of those men knew that they were going to die, that they were never going to see their wives, children, friends, or family again, but they understood that they were a part of something that was bigger than they were. 
They fought valiantly, bravely, and ultimately delayed the advance of the Persians. This little-known Greek secret is, for Greeks, the key to a successful and an impactful life. Now, this may come as a surprise to you, but after demonstrating my lack of Philotimo in the seventh grade, I was asked to kindly not re-enroll at my middle school. This is private middle school speak for get the hell out of our school and please never return to our campus. So I did. I got enrolled into an all-boys boarding school with a shirt and tie dress code every day that provided a lot of structure. This was great, but even though I was in a better place, I still had to find my thing, something that I could work towards that would not only be productive, but help me to continue to grow into the man I wanted to be and deep down knew that I could become. Now, let's take a second and think about something that makes you happy, something that brings you joy, something you can do any time, any place, regardless of who you're with, how you're feeling, what the weather is outside, just your thing. If you found it, then you know how good of a feeling that is. And if you haven't, I encourage you to keep looking because I promise it is a wonderful feeling. I said earlier that I was really competitive. This has led to me trying countless sports from football, basketball, baseball, hockey, swimming, lacrosse, even rowing for a couple of months. I came into this new school with the plan of playing hockey. So as fall turned to winter, I found myself in a locker room with 40 other 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth grade boys. 20 minutes into hockey tryouts, I realized that I was in way over my head. I looked around the ice, and everybody else looked like Wayne Gretzky. And then I saw my reflection in the plexiglass of the boards, and I looked like the Michelin man with skates on. I skated off the ice in the middle of tryouts. I went back to the locker room, took my skates and my gear off, put them in my bag for what turns out would be the very last time. I was devastated. This was another huge blow to my confidence. But the school had a policy where students had to play a sport every single season, so I had to make a choice. Now, at the time, the average height on this middle school basketball team was taller than I am today, so that wasn't really an option for me. Given my past, if I joined the book or the reading club, I would have tried to turn them into the fight clubs. Uh, farming and gardening, absolutely not, and strength and conditioning was really hard and not that competitive. So the only option that I had was to join the wrestling team, so I did. And wrestling immediately stood out to me for several reasons. The first is the singlets that we have to wear. And to a fat middle schooler, that is the scariest sight imaginable. Eventually I got over that fear, and after going to a couple practices, I realized that wrestling was in some ways a lot like chess, but this is a really overused analogy, so let me explain. In football, basketball, baseball, it's five on five, 11 on 11, or whatever the case may be. In wrestling, it's you against the man, woman, or middle schooler standing across from you. So if you win, congratulations, you did something right. You were the better wrestler, but if you lose, it's also entirely your fault. There's no equipment that you can blame, and there's nobody else out there to drop a, drop a ball, get a penalty, or have any impact on the outcome other than you. Being the competitive little deviant that I was, I found this extremely attractive. So I started showing up. I was going to extra practices, camps, clinics, anything that I could do to become better. I truly fell in love with the process. Before I knew it, I was leaving middle school, the third best wrestler in New England for my weight class, and I was on to high school. The other thing that I came to love about wrestling was I could physically see and feel the results of my hard work. I saw them in the mirror when the fat and insecure child turned into a strong and more confident young man, and I felt them on the mat when I would walk out expecting to win my matches. In the blink of an eye, it was time for me to apply to college, and I knew that I wanted to go to a business school, so I had to make a business decision. I stopped wrestling, but it left a really bad taste in my mouth. I felt really selfish for turning my back on a sport and a community that had given me so much. I still had that itch. I'm sure some of you know what I'm talking about. It's the feeling of leaving something before you're ready to leave it. Now, nobody likes being itchy, so I had to take action. I was scrolling through LinkedIn one day and I came across an organization called Beat the Streets New England. It's a youth wrestling and mentorship organization that operates in inner cities. I got on the phone with their program director and he told me the ultimate goal of Beat the Streets was to turn wrestling skills into life skills. 
This really resonated with me to the point where I basically begged him for a job. I said, I want to get involved. I don't care what I do, who I work for. I just want to be a part of this. He told me that there was an assistant coach opening at one of the middle schools in Prov, and I immediately said yes. I had no idea what to expect going into it. All I knew was that my all-boys boarding school would be very different from a public middle school in Providence, and this particular middle school needed an assistant wrestling coach. I dove in, right? What's the worst thing that could happen? Well, COVID hit. And as we all know, classrooms, boardrooms, places of work, and as I found out, wrestling rooms were all replaced by Zoom calls. Virtual learning, coaching, teaching, and working is hard, but virtual coaching is very hard. There's much easier things to do in life than being a Zoom call with 40 middle schoolers after school, trying to teach them how to wrestle or do push-ups while they're alone in their bedrooms with nobody else to wrestle. <laughs> As I kept spending time with the kids, we grew really close. I really enjoyed spending time with them. Before I knew it, the season ended with no physical practices or in-person meets, tournaments, or matches, but I found it really rewarding. So that summer, when I got a call from that same program director, he told me that Beat the Streets was expanding into a new middle school. He asked if I wanted to be the head coach, and I said, yes, absolutely. What's the worst thing that could happen? I came to find out that the school that I would be coaching at was a public charter school, and the kids at the school had primarily been kicked out of the regular Providence public schools for bad grades, bad behavior, or whatever the case may be. Sounds like the kind of place that I would fit right into. <laughs> so I showed up to my first day, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, ready to get to work. And I introduced myself to an army of middle schoolers in the gym, ran everybody through a warm-up, and then I told all the kids to go get water. It was then that I learned the water fountains at this middle school didn't work. That really struck a chord with me. In life, everybody's dealt a different hand. Sometimes you get two seven offsuit, which is the worst hand in poker, and other times you get pocket aces, but you can't control the cards that you're dealt. You can only control how you play your hand. In other words, you can't control what happens to you, but you have full control over how you respond to it. I first learned about this school of thought after reading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, and I found it incredibly insightful, so I started applying it into my daily life, and I immediately saw so many benefits that I figured I should try to teach this to some of my middle schoolers who were anxious about practices and matches. But me walking into a public middle school in Providence preaching Stoic philosophy would be about as useful as me going in there trying to teach them Chinese, which is a language that I don't even speak. So I had to boil it down, and what I came up with was only worry about what you can change, what you can control. And in life, there's so much that we have no control over. We don't control other people or our competition, how hard they work and what they do to prepare. We have no control over the weather and natural events, and we have no control over traffic. Sometimes you're just gonna be late, but there's a lot that we do have control over. You control your attitude, how you approach problems, and the effort, how much energy you're willing to put into things. You control how you treat other people, how kind, genuine, and generous you are. And my favorite is you control how you spend your time. Every single person gets the exact same 24 hours every single day. And how you choose to spend that time tells so much about what you value and who you are as a person. I started instilling these ideas into my middle schoolers, and we started growing rapidly. All of their anxieties went away. A week later, I got a call from the principal and the athletic director telling me the basketball season was starting and that I had to move my practices from the gym into the cafeteria. I also found out that the entire wrestling mat couldn't fit in the cafeteria. But I have no control over the dimensions of the cafeteria or the middle school basketball schedule. I have control over the kids on my team and what we do with our time. So we adjusted, and the kids kept showing up. They were consistent, showing up every day, eager to learn and improve. So I had to match their energy, and I started showing up early. I would help them with homework, answer questions, and do everything that I could to have them as prepared as possible for our practices, meets, or whatever the daily endeavor was. Now, for, for a school that practices in a cafeteria and doesn't have any water, it became really important for us to celebrate the small victories. We would celebrate having fun. We had a lot of fun. 
We'd celebrate getting better at wrestling. We would celebrate working on moves, winning matches, getting good grades, or just improving overall. But the thing is, as we grew as a team, so did the size of our victories. Last year, we ended the season with the first state champ in school history. This year, we had the first female state champ in school history. There's so many valuable lessons to be learned from watching the kids and beat the streets, show up every day consistently and eager to learn. These are kids that have every reason and every possible excuse to not be remarkable, yet they continue to do the remarkable. I got on stage today and I told you all why I shouldn't be here. Now, before I walk off the stage, I want to leave you with some things. I want you to bring Philotimo with you everywhere you go. Apply it in your daily life, and I promise you will see the benefits just as I have. I want you to remember that you can't control what happens to you, but you have full control over how you respond to it. I want you to scratch the itch. Nobody likes being itchy. If you want to do something, do it. And finally, don't let not knowing the outcome stop you from doing something, because you never know. Something amazing could happen. Thank you.